Thanks for coming in out of the rain. I'm Alexis Alexanian. I'm the president of New York Women in Film and Television. Thank you. Thank you. For those of you who don't know us so intimately, we are New York's preeminent <clears throat> association of women and men in film, television, and digital media. And we've been advocating for women <clears throat> in our industry since 1977. 1977. Our executive director, Terry Lawler, who's here, has been with us for, can I say 18 or 19? 19 years. So when we talk about the not so new issue of uh, gender disparity, we realize that DIWIFT has been dealing with these issues nonstop for a very long time. Uh, so NYWIFT, what do we do? We program over 50 programs a year, professional development seminars, screenings and Q&As, intimate conversations like this one, power play or breakfast. We have two signature events, our Muse Awards every December, where we honor women from behind the camera and in front of the camera and studio execs to a full house of 1,100 industry professionals. That's a wonderful event that, where we celebrate women's work. And we have our upcoming Designing Women event where we honor women in hair, makeup, and costume design. That's June 13th. It's a wonderful event. And uh, we give scholarships and grants. And we provide a very well-needed, I think, forum for women at various stages of their career to meet and greet and network and um, learn from each, from each other so if you're not a member, you should join, especially now because there is a spring drive happening. Did you see this little card? Spring drive. No pressure, no pressure, half off. Um, as president of New York Women in Film and Television, I spend many hours a week talking about, thinking about this um, idea. I've got to scooch over this way a little bit more. Of, um, the state of women in our industry. I'm well aware of, as I say, the not so new issue of gender inequality in Hollywood. Um, and I think we're all aware that this topic has hit a sort of zeitgeist. It's, gar it's garnered much more media attention than ever before. And while it's important to recognize the dearth of women directors, cue the funereal march, um, studio heads, agency CEOs, writers in the writer's room, all of the places where we don't have 50%, um, uh, nowhere near 50% of the creative collaboration, power, voice, say, etc. And while there are still too few female protagonists every day in film and television, um, and we actually contemplate doing something to remedy the deplorable state of affairs, I think it's very important and actually essential to acknowledge the places where women are thriving and working hard every day to create smart, entertaining content and actually succeed in business. So, segue to tonight, we are very thrilled, we are thrilled to have two extremely talented, dynamic and accomplished women right here with us, the founders of Maven Pictures. To my left, Trudy Styler, and her producing partner, Celine Rattray. Welcome. Now, if you IMDB, Trudy and Celine, you'll see a very, very long list of film and television credits. So we're going to truncate that a tiny bit and start at their beginning, how they met, and what sparked the idea of joining forces and creating Maven. So I had been producing films in New York for about seven years uh, before I met Trudy and producing is a really, really tough endeavor and I find that having a partner when you're making a film, whether it's a full-time partner or a partner on each movie, really makes life easier because you go through so many ups and downs and struggles and it's great to have someone by your side to commiserate and then also enjoy the good times with. Um, so I was actually looking for a producing partner at the time that I met Trudy and I'd heard a lot about her because I grew up in England and um, Trudy is much talked about and admired in, in the UK. And then specifically on one of my first ever movies, I was working with a Oscar nominated actor um, who had dated Trudy a very, very long time ago and <laughs> talked about her nonstop and was so 
still in love with her and admiring of her and um, told me... I feel page six is going to make a big deal of this. <laughs> <laughs> and told me it's no surprise that Sting is a huge success. Any man that she would have married would have become the best at what he does. It's not him, it's all her. Wow. <laughs> He was doing quite well before he met me, Selena. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was very, very intrigued about Trudy. And then we met years later. Um, it was at a filmmaker's house, and he plays this game called Mafia. I don't know if any of you guys have ever played this game, but basically there's four Mafia, and the rest are townspeople, and the Mafia are trying to kill the townspeople. <laughs> and Trudy, every round, killed everyone. <laughs> And I was like, wow, this is a really amazing woman, and I'd rather have her on my side than against me. <laughs> um, so I asked her to have lunch and um, told her that I wanted to start a company in New York and asked her if she'd be interested in being my partner. Amazing. <laughs> Follow that. <laughs> and so what made you say yes? To, why was that compelling to you at that point in your career? Um, I'd newly come to live in New York. Uh, I'm a Brit, and I'd had my own uh, production company called Shingu Films in um, in England, and I'd set up the company um, essentially for first-time writer-directors. That was my mandate, and um, uh, and I did Guy Ritchie's first film, Lockstock, and then went on to do Snatch with him, and uh, a few other films that weren't quite as notable. Uh, and I just did a, a picture called Moon. It was Duncan Jones's um, directorial debut when we came to live in uh, New York. And at that point, I'd sort of decided pretty much that I wanted to stop producing. I, I'd, I sort of like become a bit disenchanted with how hard it is for me as a creative person, because I, I was a, an actor for many years and still am. But um, and I'm not an equity person. I'm not really good with the financial aspect of of raising money and the the, the all important nitty gr gritty of uh, the the financial aspect of the film world, and so it was just too too hard for me. I mean, I'm a good producer, but I'm a slow producer because I had to figure it all out for myself. And so when I came to New York, I sort of thought I, I'll just go back. I think to trying to be an off-Broadway actress and recapture my life as an actor, whereupon, um, after I'd killed the entire townspeople uh, <laughs> one uh, summer's evening, I, I was asked to go and lunch with um, Celine, and it was love at first sight, really. Uh, we've been together uh, as partners for, for five years and done ten movies, I think we're... Um, with a with a, a sort of large slate to to come, and we just have a really wonderful time. Celine's background is I, I'm very proud of her. She did maths at Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I got beyond sixth grade maths, and then she was headhunted by McKinsey. So she so she lives in this uh, world that is really much more dominated by by men. To our point of the, the entertainment industry is really but overcrowded with men, but. Celine has this sort of fantastic uh, mathematical brain. She's also incredibly creative. So, so I think that we sort of like between us, we are really uh, we check all the boxes that it takes to have a thriving um, uh, f female-driven um, production company. Um, your story reminded me of something, and there's an incredible life lesson in this, um, which is that our first lunch, which was a two-hour lunch, and we hit it off, we had so much fun. Trudy spent the first hour and a half saying that she didn't like producing anymore and that she was done with producing. And I had come, and in my pocket, I had a little business plan to present to her, and I was going to ask her to be my partner. And she spent an hour and a half saying how much she hated producing, and I was like, I probably shouldn't bring it up because I don't want to ruin this really fun lunch that we're having. And I almost did not bring it up, which would have changed my entire life for the worst. And right at the end, I was like, you know what? There's, there's no harm in just asking, or the worst that you can have is a no. So I said, I know you said that you don't want to produce anymore, but I was thinking it'd be really great if we could start a company together. Her face lit up and she said, that's a great idea. <laughs> so there's really, um, and I think there's a lesson there for women, and I spend a lot of time with young women talking to them about how to behave in business and what, what to work on. And I think women are sometimes reluctant to ask for what they want. And they, there's a tendency to be, um, less aggressive or less forceful and we we tend to not say what it is that we want and I really always say to people including myself if there's something that you want don't be scared to ask for it and the best that can happen is it works out and 
we can all withstand rejection. It's a great, it's a great um, visual too, sitting on that, something you had prepared and that you were very sure of, and then you got cold feet, but then you decide to do it and it works. I love that lesson. And I mean, what, I think we should segue for one quick second and just take a little show of hands here to see who we have in our audience so that we can help hopefully connect with you a little bit better. How many producers do we have in the audience? Raise those hands high and proud. I'm so sorry, all <laughs> of you. And how many actors do we have in our audience? And how many directors do we have? Wow. And writers? Oh, that's great. And just cinephiles. <laughs> okay. Great. So tell us about those early days and how did you begin to develop a shorthand with each other? It sounds like your skill sets, there is a yin and yang to the skill sets somewhat. Well, we needed a name to begin with. Right. And um, Celine asked me to pick a name. And, uh, oh, you had some names too, but they were very yeah. lame. I Your, yours is the better one. <laughs> So I had a, <laughs> I had a, an aha moment uh, at, so at 3 a.m. And I, I sort of, I, 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 I dreamt where I'd come across this word. It was like raven. And it was, it, the word means it's the best at what you do. Um, and I, I was sort of like look, looking through the dictionary and, and there I found it, maven. Wow, sounds really good, maven. It's the best at what you do or self-appointed expert. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, well, that's, that's me. <laughs> uh, it's not quite Celine. Celine is an expert, uh, but um, self-appointed. Uh, but the best at what we do is what we endeavor to do at all times. We're very passionate at what we do, so we, we, we like the, the word, and uh, so then we had, we had our name. What else did we do? Um, so I think we spent a lot of time talking about what kind of movies we wanted to make and what we wanted to say as a company, and it's hard when you get asked what kind of movies do you want to make, because I think we're interested in all sorts of movies and all sorts of different genres, and I would say, you know, we, we narrowed it down to the words that really resonated with us, and one was intelligent. Um, we wanted to make, we d didn't want to make particularly lowbrow films, we wanted to make smart films, that's something to say, and then female-driven was something that we ended up really gravitate, gravitating towards. And one of the, th we review lots of scripts and lots of ideas, and we have a weekly meeting every week, and we go through all the submissions, and one of the things that I found in all my time in film is the majority of the scripts have women as afterthoughts. And so one of the things we really analyze is in this script is the woman driving the story. Is the woman the person saying, let's go to the moon, let's come up with a cure for something? Is the woman the person who has the job and the desire to get something accomplished? Or in most cases, which is really depressing to us, the woman is the girlfriend, the confidant, the sister, the woman tends to be um, defined by her relationships and the man is defined by his profession. And the woman is either the person saying, yes, you can do it, or the person saying, oh no, you shouldn't do that, it's not safe. Um, and we find that really, really depressing. So we spend a lot of time looking for great female roles and something that is empowering to women. And then also thinking about women behind the camera and how can we make sure as much as possible we hire women to write, women to direct, and women as all the different department heads. So, so I would say that's one of the defining things for our company and the work that we try to do. And then how did you, just the two of you as partners, develop a kind of a litmus test for that or, and or a shorthand to discerning uh, what, you know, which scripts are really the most powerful and which ones you wanted to put energy and money behind? Mm. Well, we we get sub we get submissions every week from you know all manner of places, from all the agencies, from um, people in my past, people in uh, Celine's past when she w was in her other production companies. We've we've got a sort of rolodex of like um, great connections that we've made through the years. But um, sitting down and just sort of like. Once you choose to make a movie, you know you're on the journey of that story, being the storytellers and begetting all the things around for a couple of years at least. And some take much longer. I took, I took five years to make a film called Moving the Mountains, five years of my life. And so you have to be really 
sort of wedded to the project because it it becomes very much your your you know you conceive it you you gestate it you give birth to it and then you you give it away you know you give it to the world so it's very important that what you do choose um, and we kicked off uh, with the girl most likely Kristen Wiig had just uh, finished her tenure at uh, Saturday Night Live and um, she was looking for independent uh, independent filmmakers to help her on her next phase of her life. And um, she chose us, and we love Kristen. She's, um, she's so talented. And that, that became our first Maven picture. And it was really actually quite challenging because we started the company in May, May five years ago, and we received the script two weeks in. And it was early June, and there was a very, very tight timeline to make that movie because she had a commitment in September. So we basically, we were in June, we had to jump into pre-production, shoot the movie and have her wrap by the end of the summer. And we didn't have any of the money in place and we had so, so much to do so quickly. Um, and her reps, uh, her, her representatives at UTA said, well, you guys have been in business for two weeks and how, why should we make this leap of faith with you? So uh, it was the first big hurdle was proving to them that we would be the right partners for her. And what ended up happening, I think, is because the timeline was so, so quick, and a lot of other people interested in this project, because it was when she'd just had Bridesmaid come out, it was a huge success in the US, it was coming out all over the world, and the success everywhere, and suddenly she was this really um, bankable actress, and no one else felt they could get it done in that summer. Um, basically, everyone said we, you know, and CBS was chasing it, and lots of very established people were chasing it, but they said, let's do it a year from now or six months from now. And because we were two weeks into business and a little crazy, we said, we'll do it, we'll get it done. So they ended up picking us because we were willing to just jump through hoops and, and get it done in, in, in the timeline that they had. It's amazing, that's a great first film together. And as I look through the roster, I see that you've nurtured the talents individually and together, the, the talents of first-time directors. And then I also see that you have a fair number of women directors, which is really encouraging and something that you don't see so so frequently in, in smaller indie production companies. Yeah, seven out of our ten movies are with women directors. That's amazing. That's really one. That's And is that is tell us a little bit about that because I think it's a I'm I'm experiencing this myself at Locomotive too we 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 do what comes naturally we take a look at the the resources that we have and I feel very encouraged today as I look around the women I know my peers have achieved a modicum of success and are decision makers and are developing directing careers and so do you look for that in particular, or is it just a confluence of, of positive events that makes it so? I think both in front of the camera and behind the camera, we try as much as possible to hire women. And I think the world is getting better. And I think so certain things in the last few months have really helped. The Jennifer Lawrence piece got so much press and attention and was really, I think, very helpful to the conversation. Mm -hmm. And the whole question of um, the diversity within the academy has also really helped. But I still do think it's much, much harder to get the movies made when it's a woman directing and um, female w w women in front of the camera. And I think what happens is a lot of the financing for these indie films is done through foreign sales. And so you put together a script, a director, and actors, and you send it to the foreign sales companies. You ask them to run numbers for you. And then based on those numbers, you convince investors to make the film. And if you have a male director and a male ensemble in front of the camera, those movies are considered more finan fi financeable internationally, which means that the numbers that you get in Latin America, in Taiwan, in Turkey are higher than the equivalent if it was a woman director and um, women in front of the camera. So these movies are still much, much harder to get made. And it's something that you, you know, as Trudy said, you have to really love the, the project and really be willing to fight for it and be willing to make it sometimes for a low budget. Do you feel like you have to be equipped with certain types of arguments to be able to, to support that For project? sure, and you know what happens, every year there are a few female-driven films that are huge successes, and every time the industry is completely shocked and people say, oh wow, there's an audience for female-driven films. And so I think uh, often the conversation is reminding everyone of those numbers, reminding everyone that 51% of the uh, 
ticket buying audience is female, reminding them that, you know, and having the list of all the movies that have done really well. So it become part of the argument is really trying to convince them and remind them of the female driven successes. I think there's a, you know, there's a, there's a flaw through the film industry at our level in the indie sector, and that is you can fight as hard as you can, and Celine and me are real fighters in the workplace to get our project going, but you know, you 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 get the best cast, the you the director of your choice, you, you make your film, and then you hand it over to a distributor. Well, guess what? Most of the distributors uh, in the film industry are are men, and so time and time again in movies that I made before I met Celine, that we came across. I've come across distributors who just don't. They buy the movie, but they don't get it like you do. They don't fight as as hard as you would, and so it it it's just falls apart at that point. And nobody really can come up with a new model. I guess that um, Netflix is going to sort of like be the restorer perhaps of like better content and better content for women. Um, but they don't really know how to win awards campaigns. I always cite Kerry Fukunaga's amazing Beast of No Nation. Why the heck that wasn't nominated for an Academy Award. But, um, but the distribution companies really have got a lot of work to do as far as I'm concerned with putting the passion into the film that they buy. Well, that's a really interesting point. And actually, um, the fact that it's male acquisition executives is also something that's really interesting because uh, we were involved in a film um, last year that is a really a lovely, sweet film about female friendship called Miss You Already with Drew Barrymore and Tony Collette. And it's a movie that shows the good and the bad of friendship and a friendship over many, many years and a friendship that's going through a difficult time. But um, what is amazing about female friendship? And it was a film that I thought was really captured that magnificently. And we uh, screened it and it had very good distribution in the UK. And then we screened it for all the US uh, distributors here that really were all men. And all of them said, well, I don't really get it. And... Um, and then one company, which was really inspired, Lionsgate, said, we don't get it. It's not for us personally, but we think there might be something in this. So they ended up screening it in the company for all the assistants and for everyone and for a whole kind of very bunch of people. And all the women were crying and loving it and saying, this reminds me of my best friend. I'm going to call my best friend as soon as I leave this movie. And so, so by having that um, thought, they saw something into it. But it was really not easy to sell a female-driven film. To, uh, to a male acquisition executive. So that, that leads me to the kind of systematic problem that we're dealing with. I mean, we're doing whatever we do. We work hard. We've been in the industry a long time. We keep fighting this fight, and yet it's much bigger than we are. So one of the things I talk about at NYWIFT is not only, you know, taking great pains to make sure there are more women writers and more women directors, but taking a bigger, broader look at the systems that are already in place. So how do we, what do we do? How do we, how do we groom women to be powerful agents and powerful lawyers and, you know, accountants and heads of, heads of studios and distribution execs and marketing mavens and those types of powerful decision-making roles. How do we really take, make you know, an all-out assault on the systems at play? I would say the number one thing we need to do is to help each other. And I think that there's a male club. Um, men help each other. Men help each other and there's really an unspoken thing where men give each other jobs and men give each other promotions and I think it's really, and I think one of the extraordinary things about about Trudy, um, she has many, many extraordinary traits, but she really, really helps other women. She's never threatened by other women. She's like a sister, she's a friend, she's someone that you can count on, she's someone that stands by you, and not all women are like that. And I think something that we really have to do is help, help women, help women, help your peers, help the women that are starting out in the business, and we need that same kind of club. What's um talk a little bit about you, Trudy, and I feel like I'm suddenly I'm Parky or somebody, or I'm, um, that, was my, that was my big English reference. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Barbara Walters, or Trudy. 
I'm not going to make you cry. Um, <laughs> tell us a little bit about your own directing career and how you found Freak Show and how you fell in love with Billy Bloom. Hmm. Um, and then you can tell us about Bet. About who? Bet. Oh, Bet. Oh, Bet. Oh, I love, we love Bet. Um, well, Freak Show uh, came to us, uh, Celine and I, um, to produce, and there was a director who was uh, all set to, to direct Freak Show. And for whatever reason, uh, it, he declined, uh, just as we were at the point of um, ready to put it into pre-prep. Um, he uh, he bailed on the project, and uh, and um, I don't know. I I think I I think I had this um, sort of like reckoning with myself that um, when I'd come to New York, I'd really wanted to become more of a creative. And uh, and when where our director left, and you know, I'd done quite a bit of work on Freak Show, just sort of like getting into script and looking at possible actors and all of that. And um, I sort of like very un unusually for me, coy, sort of like sidled up to Celine and said, "You know, how would it be if I, you know, if I?" And she said, "What?" So I said, "Well, if I, you know, sort of directed it." So, <laughs> and she said, would you? And I said, e yes. She said, well, I think that's a brilliant idea. And then she starts dialing everybody, as is her wont, and saying, Trudy's directing it. So that was, so that was really um, the beginning of it. I think it was, I think it, it had come to me that I'd nurtured and like so many first time directors, handheld, if you like, and really gone through all the processes because I love being in edit rooms and I love the color correct. And I work with a director, in fact, who was color blind. So I did the entire color correct <laughs> for, for him. He told me as we were going into the DI color correct. Oh, by the way, did I tell you? No, you didn't. Um, but. Um, so I so I've learned you know a, a lot of directing on the way, and I am an actor. So I think that I was sort of I suddenly felt uh, re reborn in a way. It was the most uh, peaceful experience I've ever had. Um, I mean, you can imagine that when you go onto a film set, there's sort of all kinds of mayhem, but it 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 wasn't like that for me. It was sort of like I've come home, kind of. Um, it was a very, very good experience. So I encourage you all who think you have a director in you, if you think you do, you do, and you should do it and not question yourself because it's, it is a, a leap into a sort of like an ocean that is very new, if it's very different from being a producer, but there's a familiarity too about it. And I think as a producer too, uh, that um, I felt very collaborative. I never feel that... Uh, that the movie is made by one person. And I've worked with a few, you know, uh, little tough uh, directors, m young men, who are like, oh, I'm, I've got the answer to everything. I've got the answer even to, you know, that actress's skirt. And well, you know, you don't. The costume, direct, the costume designer has been hired because she's at the top of her level, and you don't have the answer to that. But, uh, but as a producer who... You know, I'm quite collaborative. I like to think as as a as a human being and as a producer. So I so I know that the uh, that that you are collaborative as a as a director and um, and I hired uh, with Celine. I mean, a notable uh, below the line um, head of heads of department who were great. And I sort of consider that we all walked together forward, holding hands in Freak Show. I love I love the um, feeling at home, and I love the. It sounds organic. It sounds like your acting career and everything you've probably done in your life. I don't mean to. Put well, words I, I mouth, in informed this right. Nineteen eighty-seven. I did a um, a movie uh, in Cinecitta in Rome, um, that was uh, um, only me and a, a snake and. Uh, <laughs> And an actor who who acted with me for three days, but sixteen weeks of it was just me and a snake, and it was a uh, it was called um, Fair Game. And it was about this, you know, this young woman who was um, holed up in a loft 
with the deadly snake that had been that had had sort of its venom increased by adrenaline and her boyfriend who she jilted was trying to get even with her and kill her in the most sort of despicable way so it sounds terrible doesn't it <laughs> Well, it was largely terrible, but what was incredible about it <laughs> was that it was 16 weeks in Shinichita, and I got to work with the most incredible heads of department probably that are alive and in the cinema today. So Dante Spinotti was my mm. DP. Milena Cananero was the costume designer. Um, Helmut Newton did the stills. <laughs> um, Giorgio Moroder did the music. Um, and the late, great Ferdinando Scarfiotti did the production design. So, it, I mean, it couldn't be more stellar than that. And so at my side was Dante Spinotti every day, and uh, he said, you know, do you think you'll always be an actress? She, he calls me Trudina. Do you think you'll always be an actress, Trudina? And I said, no, I don't know, maybe one day I might even be a director. And so he said, on that day, I will be at your side. I said, really? Cut to <laughs> last year. I said, you know in 1987 how you said you'd be at my side? <laughs> Meanwhile, he's done LA Confidential and The Insider and The Last of the Mohicans and these, all these Michael Mann pictures. He said, yes. So I said, well, that time has come. Um, he said, when are you doing it? So I said, well, we start shooting in October. He said, I'm there. That, that was it. So, so Dante was at my side. And the freak show looks very beautiful because we all know the work that he produces. And I think Trudy, for the last 20 or 30 years, has been so generous and kind to people and done so, so much good for others. And uh, for this movie, she cashed in every favor that she'd done for <laughs> others. <laughs> And how was it? How was it with the roles reversed slightly? You're directing to pr your producing partner as a producer. How did that work? Oh God, she's tough. <laughs> <laughs> she's really <Yeah>. tough. <laughs> I think what was great with Trudy as a first-time director, she'd been by the side of first-time directors for so many years and really understood the job that they needed to do, and then also knew how to balance the creative needs of the movie with the. Uh, realities, so it was it was not your normal. It was a very very experienced first time director. And then for you, did you have to sort of choose your battles, so to speak, whether they were company issues or you know the macro versus the micro, or how did you? I think what was tougher about it is as a producer, you're you're really um, saying no so much of the time, and it's a really heartbreaking thing because you wish you could just say yes, but there are realities of the length of the day, the length of the shoot, and the resources that you have. And it was it's much, much harder to say no to someone that you love and has been by your side and will continue to be by your side. So I think it was it was a more painful no for me. It was also in New York, you know, it, New York has been, because of the 30% rebate here, I mean, it's an absolute hub for movie making. Everybody wants to come to New York and make a movie. So actually f finding a crew here, becomes really challenging. And I think this is one of the things that we were up against last fall um, when we were doing our 22-day shoot picture that everybody, but everybody had been taken up. And so many TV series are now being shot here and they take an awful lot of like amazing talent. And of course, who isn't gonna work on a long TV series when you've got mouths to feed as opposed to a 22-day picture shoot for you know scale so uh, so so it was pretty pretty hard um, that said we we did get a, a fantastic crew and uh, and we got we 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 came in on the 22 days and uh, that it did go a bit over budget but considering the challenges that we had I think that we did pretty well that's that's to be admired and um just thinking about the scope of the project and because you bring up the budget and how difficult it is to... We love New York and we, I love shooting here and have done so for a long time. But I know that it's difficult today with it being as busy as it is. And um, I just wonder when you were suddenly looking at your own project that you would direct and you're matching that with numbers, which can be um, shocking sometimes. Um, how did you reconcile the scope of what you had in mind to the budget? And was what was that process like for the two of you? 
I would say for me, I think there's an overall problem that I've seen in the business um, over the last decade or so, which is the cost to make a movie keeps going up every year. And that's driven by inflation. That's also really driven by the unions because the rates keep going up. So it's you used to be able to make a $2 million film and have 25 to 30 days and have enough resources. And now making a movie for that same amount is so much more challenging. But yet the value that you get out of the movie has not gone up. So if you have a movie with a mid-level actor and you sell that movie all over the world, the number that you get has not gone up. So what's, what, So basically the movie's really getting squeezed because it's more and more expensive to make it, but it's not easier to raise the money for it. So I think that's kind of a, a high level um, issue that you have. And so as a result, you just, I think you get less days than ever to shoot your movie. You have to be cheaper than ever. You have to make great deals. And it's, it's, it's bec I think from that standpoint, it's become much tougher to make films. So the rigors, the rigors of budgeting, which we know very well, are suddenly even more important to a small film that is your passion project. But I just wondered, when you envisioned the film, the way you envisioned the film initially, and the way that you made it, how did, how did they match up or not match up? Well, it, you know, it magically came together because... Um, you know, when it was decided that I would direct it and just jump in, and that we, then then we counted the 22 days, which we, was all we could afford. It was not only all we could afford; it f had us wrapping the day before Thanksgiving. Mm. So it was sort of like predetermined anyway, because we definitely couldn't have had Thanksgiving and then you know all regrouped when we had um, a few people who were you know LA and going back to families from Thanksgiving. We couldn't have afforded to have brought the whole kit and caboodle back after Thanksgiving. So it was like, okay, this is what we've got. We've got 22 days. We've got this cast that I think have really dropped from heaven. You talk about Bette Midler. What a great pal she tell turned us, out tell to us. be. <laughs> well, Bette is... Um, she's... I think that she's one of the great women on the planet. Um, she's been such a voice, for, uh, an activist voice for uh, gender equality. Um, she's a gay icon, you know, she's sort of thought she was there when no one else was there fighting the good fight. She's, she's such a huge heart, the stuff that she's done um, for conservation uh, in New York and Central Park. Um, I, I met her years ago when, uh, because Sting and me have an environmental um, foundation and she's always been active in Central Park. So when we first came to live in New York, I got to, to know her a little bit. Um, and so we, we needed uh, ca this character in Freak Shows called Muv, who's the mother of Billy, our protagonist. And... Um, and also Bet, you know, she's um, she's a bankable name. So when we were having to get the finances together for Freak Show, the minute you mentioned Bet Midler's name, you know, a certain number is triggered. And so I just had this conversation with her on the phone, and she, she, I said, would she read it? She read it. She loved it. Um, you know, the the film is about uh, is about gender equality. It's about uh, tolerance. It's about um, the about bullying in high schools and how it's escalated in such a myriad of appalling ways. So, you know, Bette's heart sort of like immediately went out to the script. And even though her character is somebody who is absolutely non-empathic, she's a monstrous mother, but Bet sees the sort of the goodness of the of the project, and she looks beyond that and thinks anyway she has a hell of a time playing a <laughs> you know a, a, a villain. Um, and she said uh, she said yes to me in a phone call and and put her trust and faith in me, which I will always be so uh, grateful for and and hugely moved by, I might say. Um, and and we had this like wonderful time working with each other. She asks a hundred questions. I mean, the reason Bet is where Bet is is she's a consummate pro. She she's, she never complained about you know not having you know great dressing room or all the bells and whistles that would probably come to her for some other uh, projects that she would work on. And she's absolutely a team player. And in fact, one Saturday. Um, she was off, but there was going to be a, 
um, a scene with the young Billy, who was uh, supposedly an 11-year-old, and he had to dance with her, like a really good waltz. And I asked our actor, could he do a waltz? And he wasn't really very familiar with what that word even was. <laughs> so, so I called up Bet. I said, oh, Bet, I, I feel horrible to disturb you after you've had such a big uh, week with us. But would you ever um, see our uh, young actor and uh, work with him on the dance? Then she booked her dance space. She has her own dance space. And uh, she booked three hours. <laughs> so this, this poor little kid, he was what, run ragged learning the walls. <laughs> and we was like, it's okay, but it's just like the rudiments of the walls. We do. It doesn't have to be a Viennese waltz or anything. <laughs> but she was having such a great time. And uh, I just like loved the fact that she just sort of commits to stuff and throws herself into it hook, line, and sinker, and uh, I, I just can't, I don't have enough words to say we adore her, don't we, Celine? And where are you? You're in post now on Freak Show? Yeah, we're in post. We've got, uh, um, we're, um, we're the v we've got some visual effects, so we have, uh, it's set in a high school, and the environs of the high school at homecoming, so there are homecoming floats, and so our bleachers had 50 extras, and it's supposed to be 1,500, <laughs> so, uh, you sort of keep moving them around, and uh, <laughs> and then v VFX magic magically to create fifteen hundred people out of the same fifty people, and you do that again in the auditorium, a lot bigger than this, where um, Billy, our hero, makes his homecoming speech. So we're waiting for the VFX uh, to come back to us. In the meantime, I'm screening it for. Um, usually 18 to 25 year olds, because I think that's where the movie sort of ha will have the most resonance and asking um, them for their feedback and uh, to give me notes and to uh, really tell me where the movie isn't landing right now. And, uh, and that's been very helpful. And then we'll, um, we'll go back into the edit room for three or four days in May. And then I work with Dante on the color correct and we're bringing on a composer in the next couple of weeks. So, um, so that's where we are. Sounds exciting. Is there, a, um, is there a plan, a festival plan, or what are you thinking? What, what's your sort of wish list for the, the future of the film, or, or a way to set it up or sell it? I don't know. Is there a distributor? Um, no, no it's independent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I think for a film like this, Sundance is probably the best. It's, it, in my experience, it's the best place to sell American films, but we'll have to see schedule-wise if we're done earlier or how it'll play out. Okay, very yeah. exciting. We'll stay tuned for that. I like Sundance. It's been good to me. Yes. Well, me so, too. Toronto is also a great festival, but Toronto has a lot of bigger films. So if you're a little independent film, you might get lost. But Sundance, it's just it's a place that celebrates American independent film and celebrates low-budget film, and it has such an extraordinary audience. Every movie, every movie I've ever had at Sundance, the audience, they, they laugh, they cry, they clap, they're so invested. And then we always have the experience when we sell the film and then we show it in a normal place. You show it in, in New York in a multiplex. and you, you always say, why aren't they laughing? Why aren't they as engaged? <laughs> because the Sundance audience is just such an extraordinary audience. I think it's a good point. Um, being raised about film festivals, and I, you know, see that we, with your show of hands, we've got a lot of filmmakers out there. I, you know, the the whole paradigm shift has happened in the for certainly the twenty years or so that I've been around um, filmmaking, um, and that is that when I first went to Toronto with a picture, it was a f it was an independent film festival, right? Now Toronto. Um, albeit it's, it's, they have very enthusiastic audiences, but it's, it's, it's the exposure now for all the Oscar movies. It's also a, a, a place that is easy to get to for talent to come, so all the big Hollywood blockbusters tend to want to expose their movies in Toronto. So you get, uh, you know, the big, the big theatres are going to contain the A-listed actors and they're going to have their movies come out before December so they'll be considered for the Academy Awards. Meanwhile, the little guys who've made smaller pictures get shunted out by buses into, you know, you're more out in the boonies and and you really get, get, could get ignored by the market that you're trying to appeal to. You are there 
trying to sell your movie. That is precisely why you're there. And precisely why Toronto was created was for the independent film sector. And it's no longer the case. We do still have Sundance, thanks to you. Know, Bob Redford really has been such a amazing friend to filmmakers for so many years that that's unlikely to change. But it's really, and uh, Venice now, getting people to Venice to show up is so hugely expensive that nobody would be, you'd be crazy to try and go and market your movie there. And Cannes is extremely specific. So there are very few places you can actually take your picture to get sold now. It's a, it's a relevant frustration. I think we, we see that the bigger festivals have become much more of a showcase for commercial films. So like, to your point, instead of um, having your having the people, the buyers and sellers be in a room watching something new and smaller and fresh, they're actually wanting to be somewhere where there's talent and a red carpet and an opening. And it sort of, dif it sort of is distracting from the main business at hand. Mm -hmm. It almost makes me think, not that we need another festival, but that we need to I think people should, um, I don't know if you guys thought, think this is a, an idea worth tracking, but the Spirit um, Awards, you know, I think if that festival became more important and had sort of some better money put into it, some great investment into it, I think it could be a really great platform for, for the independent uh, film market. Well, that's the vibe. That's the whole scene, right? Th and that's what Sundance was 20 years ago? You know, even Sundance is oversubscribed and feels too crowded and too busy, right? Um, so it's tricky trying to find the right audience and it's all about appropriateness, right? Whether it, you're casting or you're crewing up or you're showing your film, it's all about trying to just nestle it in the right spot to be as well received as possible. Mm -hmm. The challenges continue. But I hear there are some other exciting news for Maven, um, Jessica Chastain and Freckle Films. You want to tell us a little bit about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Trudy and I were in LA a year or so ago, and we were having all sorts of meetings. And one of the meetings that we had was with a whole bunch of agents at CAA. And um, Jessica Chastain's name came up, and she had a project that she was looking to produce. And we were both huge fans of hers, um, both as an actress and then everything that she stands. She's just so in intelligent and passionate and good at what she does. So we said we were really interested in, in doing it. And um, it turns out that she lost the rights to that project, so that project never happened. But we'd started a relationship with her through that. And then a few months later, heard that she was very serious about producing and wanted to start a production company. Um, and there were lots of people who were interested um, in helping her and backing her. Um, so it was a competitive situation and Trudy and I both spent time with her and really um, found that we had similar missions in terms of the films that she wants to make and the films that we'd like to make and that we really had the same kind of taste and the same objectives. Um, so she decided to go with us, which we're thrilled about. So. Um, her and her uh, development executive are now working with us out of our office. And um, since we started, we optioned three books and one true story. Um, and we're looking for other projects. But basically, she wants to make you know great movies for women and minorities. And um, it's really exciting to be there to help her and support her. It's, thr it's thrilling. I think talent is a magnet for talent, so clearly you've been able to do that and harness it. I'm wondering if we should open it up to some questions from the audience. Do we have any questions? You, right there. No. Hello. Um, yeah, I just wish you could talk a little more directly about the creative collaborative process and on the one hand uh, specific things that you feel like by collaborating you've been pushed to take creative risks and on the other hand issues of uh, power sharing in creative collaboration something you have vested interest in <laughs> um, and things that you found challenging that you've gotten to the other side of or not 
actually. So just the two sides. One is like the creative um, process and that's pushed you to make creative choices that were riskier through the process of collaboration, if that makes sense, if that has happened. And the other is like the power sharing and how um, power sharing has been conflictive at some point and resolved at some point or not. Um, in terms of the first bit of, of the question, um, I, I really, really respect Trudy's creative instincts, but also her reasons for wanting to make a film. And I think one of the things that's been really helpful is have her analysis on scripts and on ideas and really ask, why should we make this movie? What's the reason to make this movie? And I think there's a lot of scripts that probably are not that bold or not that interesting, and she tends to really see that. And then when there is something that is um, just a little bit more original or hasn't been made or is saying something really interesting, she tends to really push us towards those projects. So I think um, it's great to have a partner that pushes you in that way and really says, but why should we be making this? What's the point of this movie? What's this movie saying? And um, I think before I met Trudy, we would probably be making movies just to get a movie made and because you, you needed to get a movie made because that's our job. And um, Trudy asks really the right questions about why we're making it and what it says. Like this um, this uh, summer, we begin um, a picture that is actually going to be shot inside a prison. Um, it's called OG and Jeffrey Wright stars in it. And um, our lovely female director, um, Madeline Sackler, is going to, um, she's, she's um, documentary maker and she's um, been making documentaries uh, for a long time. This is, this is her first feature, isn't it? And she um, and she's um, created a really good relationship within the correctional facility in Pendleton, um, Indiana. And I'm just so proud of this project that uh, is going to um, include sort of some kind of rehabilitation for the inmates. It's a really important story um, about the penal system. Jeffrey Wright, we all love as an actor, right? He's incredible, and um, and I just, I'm just so. It, it was something that you, to your question, you just can't say no to something like that. It's a unique opportunity. It's going to give so many people a chance to sort of feel differently about life and think differently, and for us as filmmakers to really sort of like get to know a group of people that we wouldn't normally be exposed to. Um, and um, and I'm hugely excited about it, and so so is Celine. So um, she's worked incredibly hard to create the the financial picture for it, and we're um, green to go in June, and um, I'm going to be going down to do an acting workshop um, in um, in in May, and we we shoot until the end of July. So it's uh, hugely exciting that for us. And very different, very different experience for Maven, and certainly very worthwhile. I think we like to just sort of like really look at projects for their own merit and their own worth, and what can what can we learn from them too? And I'm, I'm all about, you know, growing old disgracefully. <laughs> <laughs> but I think just to kind of bring that back to what you're saying about the creative collaboration, what happens then is that you recognize the merits in a project. It may not be exactly what Maven has done before, but then you kind of have a shorthand or you both come to, to evaluate it on the, same, on the same sort of premise, right? And you, is that what's happening? Yeah, that's right. You have discussions about it, and Trudy really asks, you know, why wh why are we making this? What's the point? And in a case like this, she she actually didn't ask the question. She said, "We absolutely should do this." Um, we both felt the same way, and I think in terms of the second part of the question, I I I don't really view it as power sharing because I think it's about collaborating, and we collaborate with each other, and we collaborate with our rest of the team at Maven, and then everyone that we work with on the film. And you, you don't always agree on everything, but I think the discussions are always really interesting and fruitful and you hope that you know between different people's opinions you always end up with the uh with with the right decision do we have any other questions yes yeah. elizabeth i'm sorry the right behind you
I think there's a couple of challenges that we have to overcome as producers because of the digital landscape. And I would say one of them, when you're selling a movie in the old days, old days, 10 years ago, you'd have a movie screen at Sundance and four days after your screening, the variety review would run. And sometimes the variety or Hollywood Reporter reviews would not be so good and sometimes they would be good, but you really had those four days to sell the movie in a vacuum because the distributors either liked it or didn't like it. Now, um, in the last you know couple of years of selling movies, halfway through the screening of your movie, that you're already getting press reactions and you're getting audience reactions, and it can range from an amazing you know Oscar-worthy film, and you're like, how do you know you're only halfway through? <laughs> to this movie really, really doesn't work. So the good and bad, bad buzz is so quick. When you're selling the movie, and the same thing when the movie's getting released, and you, you know, that's why the distributors, the studio distributors are going wider and wider, and they're now releasing movies on 4,500 screens because they really want to get as much business by you know, Friday afternoon before that buzz has negative or positive has, has spread. So I think it's a, it's a much harder, harder uh, endeavor that we have from that standpoint. And I would say the other bit of it is I think in, in our age of information spreading so quickly and you know, whether it's news or whatever it is, people's expectation that you're relevant um, are so high. And I think the challenge for producers is you're picking a script that typically you're gonna develop for about two years and then you're gonna shoot and then it's gonna take a year before you get the movie out to an audience. So you're typically four years ahead of the movie getting released, trying to gauge what audiences will care about and what they will think will be relevant at that point. And one funny example that I had with that was The Kids All Right, because that was in development for eight years. And we finally, you know, after years and years of work, scraped the money together and managed to make the film. And then the film, which was about same-sex marriage, came out just as the Prop 8 vote was happening in California. And all the reviews and all the press about it was like, this film has captured the zeitgeist of today. <laughs> And we were thinking, we are so lucky because this script was written more, over eight years ago and it wasn't capturing the zeitgeist of that time. Great movie. Yep. Uh, Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for what you're doing because so many of us out here are women making films, whether we're writing them, directing them, producing them, and just to have you spearheading, you know, this production of films that are driven by women is terrific. I mean, you talk about the problems with distribution. Well, they exist at every level, and so just first off, thank you for that. And I, I also have a question. You uh, spoke about looking for scripts where the story is driven by a woman. I think that's great. However, I know I, I run an initiative at NYWIFT to help women filmmakers put together packages for their feature films. And in that process, we have to select projects. And there are many wonderful, interesting films written by women that have male leads. And I find that the, a woman's take on a man is very needed in the world. You know, it's a more complex portrait showing weakness as well as bravado. And I, two of the films you've mentioned, both Freak Show and this new one in the prison, seem to have male leads. So you're also open, just so we all know, you're also open to stories that have as a main character a man as well? Absolutely. Okay. I think we, you know, if something is a great piece of writing, it's something that we'd want to get involved in, you know, regardless of the gender of the, ma uh, the main characters. Absolutely. And I do agree with you. I think a woman's take on a man is, is very interesting. And often has all sorts of nuances that you might not find if a man had written it. Thank you. I'm a sound editor by trade and a wannabe producer. And um, a friend wrote a script that I, I've been working with her and her husband for a couple of years, putting the story into script form, but it still needs uh, it still needs something before it's here. It's a finished script. So I, I was wondering if you could elaborate on development. And we don't have $30,000 to hand to, you know, a, a big time writer to polish it. So I'm trying to figure out how, 
whether I go back to the writer and work with her some more, or do we go to a production company uh, with something that's not quite finished? And I know I, it is. Yeah, I would say to try and get it as far along as you possibly can, because mm -hmm. typically when you send it out to the world, when you send it to agencies or producers, you'll only get one read. And I think the further it is and the best shape that it's in, the better shot you have. I think in terms of development, having lots of people read it, because what happens with development for all of us is we start getting too close to something when we've read it eight times and you don't really see what it needs anymore. So having you know friends, colleagues, people around you read it and have fresh reads, I think that really helps. And then one of the things that we've been doing recently on a couple of projects which has helped us so much is to do readings. Um, and you can do readings for free. You just you know f find five actors or friends or people who will read the different roles. And there's so much when you hear something that you wouldn't have seen on the page. And with a reading that we did recently on, on a project that we love, we saw that there was a whole chunk in the middle that really you, you lost the energy and the project really sapped. And you, do, you don't feel that when you're reading it because when you're reading it, it's you're in control of the timing. But when there's actors reading it, you see the places where there's a lull. So I think readings are, are really helpful. And the, the best thing to do is to try and push it along as much as possible. In terms of working with the the main writer versus other writers that's always a dilemma because um you want to push it as far as possible with the writer that you're with out of loyalty but sometimes there's a point where that writer may not have the skills necessary to get it all the way so that's always something that you also have to evaluate that's a, i think having a reading i think is a great idea because there's so many new york actors around they love doing readings they're very very helpful at giving you feedback after the read through and you know, and in our experience, they don't ask for a lot other than, you know, some great coffee and snacks. They, I mean, <laughs> but that they're incredibly generous. And I think you'd get um, some good feedback by just doing that. Absolutely. So after the reading, what we usually do is we stay right away with the writer and the key people involved. And then we say, how do you feel that it went? And the writers are usually, you know, that they're, they're so overwhelmed with things that they hadn't realized when they'd written it. But it, it's very, very clear when it's read. So I think it's very illuminating for them. And then you guide them along and you, you know, take notes and then um, and then have them execute on them. Right here. Can you talk a bit about more um, more about the pre-sale process? Uh, I'm asking about the pre-sale process and balancing that international aspect with the domestic distribution. And you know, doesn't the foreign sales agent want a domestic distributor in place? And then can you use the mic? If you use the mic, it's yeah, uh, is this better? Yes. Yeah. So I'm asking about the, the pre-sale process and balancing the international aspect of it with the domestic distribution. And which comes first? Doesn't the foreign sales agent want a domestic distributor in place first? And it's it's very, very hard to get US distribution on a film on an independent film, on a small independent film with a first time director or a low budget film. You know, those distribution deals, uh, most of those companies, their business model is to wait for the festival and then pick and maybe overpay for the very, very best films of the year, but not to take a chance on a two to four million dollar film. So that's, uh, we've, I don't, I think only on one film in my whole entire life have I had US distribution in place from the start. Um, what we do when we evaluate, when we, when we take on a project and you have the script, the director and a couple of cast members is we have to figure out what's the right price to make the movie for and what number can I get this movie financed at? And so there's three numbers that you look for. You look at what is the tax credit, which is amazing, that's free money. What 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 is that that I can get on this project? What's the best place to shoot and what is that number? And then you look at what is foreign worth and what is domestic worth. The domestic number is harder to predict because the domestic number really fluctuates depending on execution. So the same project, if it comes out pretty good versus really, really good, that number will fluctuate, fluctuate hugely. Um, the foreign sales numbers fluctuate a little bit less, and so you get a good sense of what foreign is worth. And so what we do is find out those three numbers, and based on that, then we set the budget so that the budget makes sense for investors, so that investors want to finance their films. Let's go right back, straight back here in the middle. Oops. Trying to be geographically diverse. <laughs> Hi, my name is Leah, and I 
I'm from Los Angeles. I've been working in the animation and VFX industry for about 10 years now, and I'm about to start my own company. I'm going to try to be bi-coastal and have a lot of good, um, supportive men whom I've worked with helping me out. And my question is, was there ever been a time in the very start of your company where you just maybe felt a little overwhelmed or things looked um, every, that it every might day. not have worked out and, you know, just on the fringes of kind of giving up and, you know, starting with something new. If there was that moment, what was the catalyst that helped you overcome that and establish, um, you know, the just the endurance that pushed you through that to get you to where you are now and to avoid the the fear of backing down when um, <laughs> when you you know are still like oh if I just put this much more into it I can make it or you know that's that's my question um, <laughs> what what got you here at the, at the moment where you might have backed down when you shouldn't have I, I'm going to answer that to begin with because I think it's it's something that I apply in my marriage. Never go to bed mad. So, <laughs> so I have two marriages. I am, a, I am a bigamist. I'm married to Sting, and I'm also married to <laughs> Celine. And uh, so, in in business, um, y you, these days that you speak of are kind of every day. There's some asshole nipping at your ankles <laughs> and giving you a hard time for reasons that you'll never know uh, and aren't worth knowing. Um, but it's, it's just, you know, you have, um, when, I be, when I switch from being an actor to a producer, I, I have this, this image of the movies already made and everything is catch up and all it is is just sort of the passion and energy that the momentum driving you forward to the picture that you see ahead of you. And my life isn't nearly as lonely as it was when I was at Shingu, because I have Celine. And, and, the, and the jokes come thick and fast. I mean, if we're working with a, a, a group of people who are, you know, are less than fun, shall we say, <laughs> we, we just get it all out on the phone and we just are extremely vocal uh, with each other. And we just like die laughing. And it's, it's really, I think laughter is a fantastic panacea for, for so much. Um, but everything in the in the entertainment in industry goes wrong in the course of it's all four seasons in a day so so just like just stay with it and work with people that you really love working with and uh, be there for them and they'll be there for you and and pick your projects wisely because you're going to be with the project for you know a few years uh, and just and always see try and see the best in in the person, so even you know, assholes have bad days, <laughs> and they're just people too. <laughs> Celine, maybe you've got something more grown up to say. No, that was wonderful. <laughs> I have nothing to add. <laughs> I would just like to point out that both of you have um, significant others and children, and we're constantly talking about this life-work balance. Although I read recently that it's not supposed to be a balance; that it's actually kind of like puzzle pieces that fit together. And do you have any other advice for people trying to manage all of those things, being a wife, being a mother, being a significant other, producing film, making business, doing business every day? Stress. Stress. <laughs> Celine, you, you can answer that. Well, <laughs> I have two young kids that are three and one and a half. And <laughs> I heard a collective groan. <laughs> well, before I had them, all I cared about was film. And I woke up in the morning thinking about film. I thought about film all day long. I went to sleep thinking about film and I dreamed about films. It was really the only thing in my life. And when, um, when, when my husband and I uh, had the first child and then the second child, I really wondered about juggling and about trying to be a good mother and trying to stay focused as a good producer and, and tr getting it all done. It's actually turned out to be the best thing that's ever happened to me. And 
I don't really see it as too much of a juggle because when you come home at night, no matter how rough your day has been and what battles you've been in, the love that you feel for children and they feel for you, it's, it, it's so rich and rewarding and wonderful that it makes me forget every, you know, all the struggles of the day. So it's, it, for me, it's been a really, really rewarding thing. That said, it's, it's not easy and it's not easy to do both well and you feel guilty all the time. And I think the modes that are expected from a woman, it's very challenging because during the day you have to be strong, you have to negotiate, you have to be a business person. And then I find I go home and from the second I go home, I have to be you know, loving and maternal and sweet and, and thoughtful towards these children. And then the kids go to sleep and my husband wants me to take care of him and you have to get into a whole different mode. And juggling all of that, at, sometimes at the end of the day, I'm like, wow, I feel like a total actress or a liar because I've just gone through three crazy modes. Dude, he should go on tour more. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hi, my name is Annette. Um, everything that you said about uh, women and the way that you select scripts um, is very inspiring. However, on the other side of her question, I am past all that. I'm a woman in transition, I'm an attorney, and uh, I was a litigator, and uh, the only uh, things that I've produced have been, you know, off-Broadway shows. So now I want to embark on an, a transition in my life. I have a 25-year-old and a 28-year-old daughter and a 25-year-old son. And um, so I look at their struggles, they're both artists, um, and how daunting it is, especially for my daughter. Uh, she's an actress. And here I want to make movies. I want to write. I have a story. I have stories inside of me. And um, so I think, wow, you know, you're talking about audiences and you're talking about audiences between 18 and 25. And the story I want to write is not that. It's for women my age. You know, it's for middle-aged women and beyond middle age. And is there a market for that? And are Absolutely. you within your company thinking about scripts in that way as well and addressing those issues? Because, you know, uh, you know, life is a, is a lifelong struggle to juggle and to be relevant and to make the most of your life and to change the world in the process if you can, you know. Uh, we, we actually always talk about that audience. And I think women age 40 plus is a very underserved audience. And interestingly enough, when right now the indie film world is driven by that audience. And if you see the Paris Theater, any of the great art house theaters, the Angelica Theater, any theater where on a Friday night there's a line around the corner, is it's, it's all people in their 40s, 50s, 60s wanting to see films. So I think that's a really, really underserved audience. And you see like right now the success of My Name is Doris and various other films. It, it really feels like if you have a movie for that audience and it's well marketed, it does very, very well. Good luck with that. I think that you're doing the right thing. Hi, um, I'm a screenwriter and I have a project that I was very surprised to get a, a really great call back from a senior vice president of worldwide acquisitions at Sony. And he, he spent a lot of time with me on the phone telling me about all the great things about the project. It's a $5 million film. Um, at the end of the call, you know, I said, you sound so excited about this project. I'm just curious, what is it that's keeping you from actually wanting to produce it or buy it? And he had said, I can, you know, I can front the $5 million. So I said, well, you know, what's, the, what's holding you back? And he basically said, you don't have a producer attached. And in his words, a producer who can handle the shit show if, if things go awry. So, um, so my question, I have two questions. One is, why would somebody in that position not just package it themselves and attach a producer? Um, and, and secondly, how do I go about finding that producer, that sort of $5 million project producer that can handle a shit show? Um, I have a manager, the manager's, you know, okay. <laughs> but if you were in my shoes, you know, how would you go about figuring out who those people are to approach? Um, I would say, in terms of the first part of the question, people want their jobs to be as easy as possible. So I find that whether it's an agent, whether it's a studio person, everyone wants the easiest thing to say yes to. And I think that person is probably evaluating your project relative to 20 other projects that day, 
some of which might have cast already, have an established producer, have more put together, and it's easier, and it's an easier road to production to say yes to something that has Jeremy Renner attached to star and has an established producer than something that you'd have to put together from the start. So I think just always remembering everyone wants an easy time. Um, in terms of finding a producer, you know, the, you're in the right city. This city is filled with producers who make $5 million films. And what I would do in terms of your manager, you, you have to make your manager's life easy as well and do all the research yourself. Look at what films you've liked in the last few years in that budget range that have the same kind of tone you know, and, and, and look up who those producers are and then say to your manager, send the project to these eight people and set up a meeting with these eight people. And so give your manager something really you know, a very easy task to, uh, to fulfill. Okay, good. We have time, I think, for one more question. How about over there in the slide, please? Hi. With what's going on in television, with what's going on in television these days, you reference Netflix and everyone's binging and it seems that when you go out to dinner, the conversation, if it isn't about what's happening with Donald Trump, it's about what's happening <laughs> on television. So with that being said, do you have any interest in doing anything with television in a miniseries um, or some sort of movie for TV? Or are you thinking about television? Yeah, we, we, we are thinking about television. We'd be foolish not to think about TV because it's uh, it, it could be Maven's bread and butter in the future. It could sort of be putting the roof over our heads. Uh, so we have to think pragmatically as well. The thing is, is that Celine and I are really picky on uh, what kind of stories that we want to tell the world. And so we're, we're looking at a few things for, for TV. Um, I think one of the things that we've looked at recently is uh, there was a film that I made in the 80s with um, Robert Downey Jr. called A Guide to Recognizing Your Saints. Um, now, am I talking about it's 10 years old? Why did I say the 80s? Uh, sorry. <laughs> Just felt feel so long ago. Um, and th it's because it's set in the 80s, and uh, it's set in the 80s and now. So it's got it's got a sort of like a wonderful nostalgia and um, and a, a very current a current story. Um, that's sort of like is one of the things that that I'm looking at for for TV. Um, but th there's an awful lot of competition, and then getting a showrunner. Showrunners are sort of like gods they're so when they're successful they're so busy that they their roster is full for sort of years ahead someone like tom fontana um who we know has done has, has got work for the next five years so it's finding the uh, the great show showrunner the right showrunner um there are all kinds of elements uh, celine can speak to 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 this as well but maven certainly looking to to um to create um film um TV product, yeah. Well, a big thank you. Huge thank you. Not, not, only for, not only for the work that you do, but for being so candid and for sharing your time with us. It's very meaningful on a lot of levels. Um, thank you all for coming in out of the rain. Thank you, SVA, for hosting us. And they have recorded tonight's program, so it will be available on their website. I invite you all to come and have a beverage and a nibble. And, um, and if anybody has got questions that they like answering over a drink, we're very happy to do that. <laughs> Thank you.